Let's get started. So about the midterm exam will be held on week seven. And I think you have already know it, right? So there will be a open book exam, which means you can use your internet to search the answer for it. But you are not allowed to communicate with other students or other people during the exam. It will be around one hour to do it, but I think you may have extra time before you like start an exam or something. They, they may give you extra time to do the reading or something else before the exam. And um, yeah, the content will be like something around week one to week five, ex excluded congestion control. So if you have any general question related to the midterm exam, Yes, no. So let's talk about how to prepare for your midterm exam because the midterm exam is the crucial thing that you want to have a high mark if you want to get HD. So if you want to get a high mark on midterm exam, probably you should have a look of all the slides from week one to week five. And then uh, you can see a lot of creeds inside the slides and examples. Just go through them one by one. And I will like uh, go through it with you later. And for the tutorial stuff, it's just like the practice. You will practice with, with the tutorial one and the uh, homework you have. So, I mean, you need to do a lot of calculation practice before you attend the midterm exam because it, it is an open book exam. So you do not expect there will be lots of uh, memorized thing. I think most of the content will be related to the calculation and your understanding. So just make sure you can fully understand all the content from week one to week five. And if you just like holding, hoping to use the slides to find the answer, it will be very hard during the exam because the time is really limited. You need to really make sure you understand everything before the exam. The content here, uh, I think I have already uploaded the content into our GitHub in here. You can see a uh, folder here. I will share the GitHub link again. In our chat. So just click this folder. For the slides, I have helped you to merge all the slides from week one to week five. So just click this link and download this PDF file. and then open it. So just the merge version from week one to week five. So if you have any question during the exam, it will be very convenient to like search around it. For example, you have some problem related to the DHT. Remember what is DHT, just search. 
So you don't need to switch around different files and find it. That should save your time during the exam. So that's the first thing, slides. And the second thing. Let me check. Uh, some notes you may need. This one. So it contains some key things from week one to week five, but it's from previous year. So I'm not sure it's up to date. You can just have a look of it before the exam to just go through every key point of it. In P, DM, FDM, something like that. And just go through it by yourself. It's just a note. Yeah, I think that's all. And have some sample questions. So beside the tutorial and the homework, you can also find some practice material here, like uh, here, sample question application layer. Let's click it. Some, so there are some other practice material from previous year. So if you want to do more practice, just come here and the answer is in the same folder here. You can see, something like this. I think we have, we still have like sufficient time to do the preparation. It's around, you have still have like one or two weeks, around two weeks. So let's just, start from the slides review with the quiz and you can do the tutorial stuff and practice stuff by yourself because no matter how i explain on the class you still need to do by yourself right it's a calculation so in today we will just just go through all the content from week one to week five but of, of course i will not explain everything very clear it's just a uh, review i will point out all the key things on the exam okay so the first part is the network stuff uh, in the week one we have studied something related to internet networking stuff like the hierarchy and the layering stuff and what is the difference uh, between the circle switch and packet switch. Let's just have a look of it. Um, if possible, I want you to open the uh, slides. So we will just go through, you can make some notes or marks on the slides. So I will tell you what is very important in the midterm exam. So just open the slides on the GitHub here. Uh, here, oh, this one. I will copy the link into the chat. And open it. Let's just go to the page 34. Have a look of the first content. Yeah. So what is circuit switching compared to the uh, packet switching? So the circuit switching uh, is widely used on the phone like 10 or 20 years ago. So every phone have their own allocated road. So that can be used only for them. And the key point is not share. They are not sharing with each other. So which means the bandwidth not share with each other okay 
and the FDM and TDM basically means the way how different user use the same uh, road or, or same connection. For the frequency uh, division, we allow the user use the connection all the time by dividing the frequency. Uh, for the TDM, the time division multiplexing, we only use one user use, uh, use the connection at the same time. But they are only used for a very short period and switch to another one. So just have a roughly look of it, just try to understand it. But I don't think they are very important in our metering set. Only you need to uh, know about it is what is the difference between the circuit switching with the packet switching. So let's have a look of the key points for the packet switching. First thing is the packet switching will slice the data into different chunks. As you can see here, the pictures will be sliced into like one, two, three, four, five, five chunks and separately sent to the our destination. So in order to send it, we need to have a header. It's like a, uh, let's say, uh, the destination or all the necessary information to help us to send our destination. And the payload, of course, will be the content of the data. Like these slides will be the payload. So what will be the difference between these two kind of stuff? As we can see here, small each other. So it is inefficient, but the advantage is the fixed data rate because we are not sharing with each other. So other, uh, if the network is congested, it, it doesn't affect me, right? And the, I think that's all for the packet switching. So, we are using the packet switching right now. And the circuit switching is not used in our current internet anymore. Probably in somewhere, but not in here. Let's just come to the first exercise. Pros and cons of circuit switching. The, yeah, the drawback of circuit switching, of course, will be the inefficient because we are not share, even we are not using our uh, resource. But yeah, it should be like stable than package switching, right? Because other people cannot use my resource. So you can like have a look of the lecture. I think we have, mention a lot of pros and cons during the lecture. Just try to uh, write down the answer and back to the lecture and compare the answer of it. The second one, which resources are allocated on demand? Sorry, we get a question here. So the switching does not need to break data into smaller because it's a direct connection to destination. And you can say that we don't need to break the like the data into smaller pieces. All right. Yeah. So let's back to this question here. In what kind of switching? are allocated on demand. What does this mean? Let's get back to these slides here. I have a look of this picture. 
uh, allocated on demand, which means if we need to send something to outside, let's say to this one, to, to the right hand side, we can use any like road we want and or any like bandwidth if possible. So obviously the circuit switching is not sharing the resources, right? Mm -hmm. So it cannot like choose any road we want or any bandwidth we want. It's a fixed value. So this, the answer is this one. Packet switching. And because our internet is using the packet switching right now, and it is allocated on demand, which means uh, during the night, you may find your internet connection may be slower than the daytime. So that's the reason, because if more people using the internet, the like the resources will be uh, like limited. Here, a message from A to B consists with the packet X and packet Y. So in a circuit switch network, Packy Y's path is it is the same or it's different? Uh, okay, let's have a look of it. Uh, because we are using circuit switch, right? Just get back to the slides here. Circuit switch. Sorry. Uh, let's draw something here. For example, we have a packet X at first, and it goes through this road to reach our destination. And now we have a packet Y here. We need to send it to the same destination here again. So what do you think? Uh, if we assume the, the, like this, if we go to this way, the latency will be less than the original one. So which road would you think it will go? So I would say uh, if we can go this road right now, uh, the latency will be less or uh, smaller. We will still go to this, this road. Do you know why? Yes, because we are allocated for this road and we are not able to assess other roads on the internet, right? because it's not sharing. So no matter what kind of packet I want to send, I will be used the same row. And the answer is the same. And we can do the next one. Statical multiplexing. So it's on the slide page 59. Mm, here. So in here, what happened if the network congested? You can see this thing is a packet and this thing is a packet as well. And here we can consider it as a, a switch or router. So what happened if the like have they congested? Thank you. Uh, that's, that's too much. So what happened? 
if here is congested, the buffer will drop the packet. So we are showing this because we want you to know how the packet is lost sometimes in our like pin command. If you, if you like send a lot of packets from your side to a very far away destination, let's say Alaska, it will go through a lot of routers and this kind of situation may happen in be, like between the transmission and our packet will be dropped. And that's why uh, the packet losses during the con connection. Does this make sense? Yes, that part is pretty easy, right? Let's come to the delay part. So for the delay, go to the page 85. So I would say for the delay, I can like make 200% guarantee you will be tested on this part. So I think you need to pay attention for this part. Like it will be always related to the understanding or calculation, it may have both, like have several questions related to this part. So you need to understand first thing, what is four kind of different delays? If I want to calculate all the delays, uh, the delays from somewhere to elsewhere, what is the delays? Let's have a look. First one is processing. What is processing delay? Should be very easy to understand in here. You can see processing delay is in here, which means when we send a packet to a router here, because the router will require to read it so why the router need to read our packet instead of just send it directly? Because the router may connect it to another like different routers here. The, the router are connected with several routers. And if the router does not like read the contents in our packet, it will not know which line should we, should we go, should we send to. It's like you send to a post office like we, we can say it's a post office. And this one is another post office. So it's like in a delivery stuff, we send to the first post office and it will transmit it to the next post office, next, uh, like uh, closer to our destination. Let's, let's say if we have a destination C here that we want to send, sorry, my bad drawing, too bad. And connect to this one. So with the like processing, uh, the router will be able to know, oh, probably we should send to this one instead of others. So that's why we need to have a uh, processing step here. And with the processing, we will have a processing delay. So basically it's the router is reading and trying to understand in the uh, destination or the header of the packet. And it may also do some uh, check, like to verify if the packet is complete or it's already corrupted. If, if it's corrupted, it may be dropped. So that's processing delay. Uh, the processing delay may uh, only take like very few time. It will be very quick and the Second one is the queuing delay here. Yeah. So what is queuing delay? Queuing delay, you can see in here. 
this part is queuing delay, which means if we have lots of packets inside the router, it may have some delay because it, it will be in the queue. It, so this one is really depends on the uh, traffic on the internet. And the third one is the transmission delay. So transmission delay is if we want to send the packet out from the router to the internet here, we will have a transmission delay. It's like launching a rocket. We need to send it out. So it will take some time. And this one is always related to the bandwidth. And uh, you may know you, you're uh, probably you have, you have a hundred Mbps, right? In your home. So this stuff, we call it bandwidth, is always related to the transmission delay. So if we have a, uh, let's say, one GB file need to send. So what will be the transmission delay here? If we have the bandwidth with 100 Mbps and we want to send a file to the internet with one gigabyte, so how long it will take? You may say 10 seconds, I guess. So if you think it's just like one gigabyte divided by 100, that would be a wrong answer because you need to make sure their units is the same stuff. In here, when I'm talking about the one gigabyte, so it's bytes, bytes, right? And in here is bits. So it's different, it's in different units and you should always be careful of it. In the exam, we may like test your understanding on the units here. So we know one byte equal to eight bits. Yes. So you can multiply by eight and divide by 100. So that will be the answer. So if you have a like internet at your home, you can try it now. Uh, for example, you have 100 Mbps and then you will find your actually download speed is around 12 MB per second. And that's, that is the reason why. So just like make sure you do some practice on the delay calculation. We will always test this kind of thing. It's only for the transmission part and you vow oh, that yeah, it has some tricks. And let's come to the propagation. So what, what is the propagation? Uh, once we send the package into the internet, how long it will take to arrive the next stop? For example, we have a, a second connection with the same router here, but you can see the, the uh, while it's like physical distance is longer than the, this one. So the propagation delay for this line and for this line is different because the length of them is different. You okay. 
So the packet is travel uh, like between the router with the speed of light. So it will only depend on the physical distance for the propagation delay. This part, part is also very important. So I guess we can have some practice with the delays here. Propagation delay. Does it depend on the size of packet? The answer is no, right? Because we have already explained it. The propagation is only related to the dis distance, physical distance. No matter how large is the packet, it will be the same. Right, so come to the next one. So what is the correct order of the delays? So it comes to a router here. So what will be the first delay when we arrive here? It will be a processing delay, right? Because the router will require to read our packets here. So the processing here. And inside the router, what will be the second delay? It will be the queuing delay here, right? If the traffic is heavy, we may have lots of packet inside the router and it will have queuing delay. And what is the third one will be the transmission delay in here because the router will require to send out the packets into the internet. So transmission delay. And what is the last delay? Propagation, right? It will travel Okay, next one, but yeah, this one like, it's a little bit different, but it's not related to the delay. We can have a look of it. It's a circle switch. So we have 100 users, they have zero point Two, which means 20% of uh, like probability to use the internet. And each of them will require one Mbps. So what is the capacity? Yes, it will be A. So why is 100 Mbps for 100 users? but they have like 20% of usage, right? So why it shouldn't be the this one? Yeah, because the circuit switch is not sharing. So we don't consider the probability if they are using or not. And that's the reason why it's 100. Yes, let's have a look of the second one. So what if we are using a packet switching network here? The same situation. So what would be the expected aggregate traffic? In here, we will choose this one, right? Because in the packet switch network, we can share the bandwidth with, with each other. So for 100 users here, because they are like only 20% of people will be active at the same time. So we just multiple them all together 
and we'll get 20 Mbps. But it's not saying 20 Mbps for the 100 users will be enough because sometimes they will use the connection together and it may cause the congestion, right? But, uh, but the, in like, in theory, 20 is enough. This one. It is asking if queuing at R1, queuing at R1, which means uh, in here, right? We remember the queuing delay is inside the router in here if they have a lot of packets in here. Does it depend on the length of the link? So it does it depend on this one? Oh, sorry. Depends on this one. The length of it. So obviously it's no, right? Because the congestion, like the the queuing delay is all uh, uh, is always related to the traffic of the network. It doesn't related to the uh, length of the connection, but. Do you remember, is there another kind of delay will depends on the length? It will be the propagation delay, right? Propagation delay. Okay, so I think that's all for the uh, chapter one, for the basic or fundamentals knowledge of the internet. So now we come to the application layer. So what is application layer? So why we call it layer? So the first concept is about the layering. Let's come to the page one, two, three. This one, layering. Uh, we need to understand what is this slide. For example, here we are trying to send a HTTP message, which means probably we are browsing a web page. So what will happen here? Our our computer will just uh, have a create a HTTP packet, and then we just put it inside a TCP packet, and then we put a TCP packet inside a IP packet. So you may have lots of header outside of the content of the our HTTP message, right? And we can uh, go through the internet interface to the next router here. The router will read the information of the IP header and then send to the right router for next stop. And it will do the same thing. The IP, the next router will like uh, have a look of the IP header and create a new IP header and send it outside. And finally, we will reach our destination host here. And it will go through the internet interface and will unpack the IP header to make sure it's the packet for us and like read the TCP information. And then finally we will uh, reach the HTTP message. And then the host will know or probably the, uh, the client is asking for a web page. And then we can 
like right uh, response and back to the same place. Does it make sense? So it's not very easy to send the HTTP message. You can see it goes through a lot of layer and finally reach our destination. So will the routers read the message body? No. So we can see here, uh, our packet is uh, HTTP request. And then we put a TCP header outside of it. And then we put it in the IP packet and we send to the router here. You can see the uh, graph here. They only have a look of the IP packet, right? So all they need to do is just have a look of the outside of your packet. It's just like uh, HTTP is the content of your mail. And then you want to send a mail to probably your uncle and just you put your paper into, let's say, <laughs> into a, a box. And then you just write down some information outside of the box and we call it IP. So it will be the address of your uncle. And then you put it on the post office here. The post postman just sent to the post office, we call it router. And the router will just have a look of the outside of the address, right? So it will be the IPA package. So it will unpack the IP header uh, and it will see, oh, it's sent to the next station. We, so it will just write a new IP header to your packet and send it to the next station. And the next router will have a look of the IP header from, net, from previous router and create a, create a new IP packet or IP header for your message. and then you finally reach. So we call it layering. Mm, I think it's in here. So in this picture, it, it will make more sense. It's the same, same thing, but in different picture. As you can see here, host A is sending a message to host B. So it will go through the application layer. So which is HTTP, right? And the transport layer, which is TCP. And the network layer and the data link physical, right? So the network layer is IP, right? And we come to a router, the router will just go back to the network layer here, which is have a look of the IP address and then just send to the right uh, address here. And finally, we'll reach out the host speed. And in here, I want to show you the difference for the switch and the router here. Have a look of this picture. Uh, it has been texted on the, I don't remember, probably in the final exam, but you may need to know for now. So it's really easy. You can see what is the difference for switch and router here. You can see the a switch only have a look of the physical and link layer, right? It doesn't come to the network layer, which means the IP header. So the switch will not load the network information. Does it make sense? So it, it will not related to the network layer stuff. It will just send through the switch. But for the router, it will have a look of the IP header come, come to here. Right. And then send to the next destination. So this part you need to be aware of the difference with the switch and router here. So that's all the layering structure and the encapsulation. I hope you can like understand it, how we send a message. So it's not pretty easy to send a message, right? We need to pack it loss and then finally reach. It's just like do the delivery. When you bought a thing from Amazon, it will pack a lot of stuff outside of the content you need.
Okay, so remember we have five layer. And in this term, we will learn, I think this probably this one will also be learned. Yeah, but the most important part will be the transport layer. Yeah, I think that, that this one is the most important one, including TCP and UDP stuff. Yeah, but now we are in here, application layer, right? So let's just have a quick look of the application layer stuff. So what is the benefits of using a layered network model? I think uh, this kind of thing will be very easy. I just, in order to save us time, just uh, skip it. You can have a look at it later. It is on the slides. And yeah, come to here, the TCP and UDP. If you still remember what is TCP and UDP, the most important, important thing for, for TCP and in UDP is the TCP provides reliability and UDP does not, right? So. This is the key thing you should know. You can, uh, you can, you may also, you may don't know what is TCP and UDP, but you must remember the TCP provide reliability for the transmission of data. Yeah, you are right. Come to here, the page one four three. Or what is TCP and UDP and their application protocol? So, so for the TCP protocol, we can use it to send an email, uh, doing the web thing like browsing the website or do the file transfer. So why we use TCP in here for sending an email or file transfer? because the TCP is reliable, right? We can make sure all the data is arriving in the other side. Because when we send an email, we want all of our content will be delivered instead of missing a part of sentence or something. And the file will be the same. But when we are doing the streaming multimedia, like we are watching our online streaming stuff, we don't really care if we lose like 0 0.1 seconds of content or not. So we can use UDP here. And when we calling with each other, we can also use UDP for like for Skype because when we are talking with each other, we can accept if we have any losses or delay, right? It doesn't really matter for the like chatting. So what is the pros and cons for TCP and UDP here? So why should we use UDP, but TCP like give us an reliable connection? So why should we still use UDP? Because the UDP is faster than TCP. So that's the reason. So we can use the UDP to like have a look of the video. It makes us faster. And come to the HTTP one. Uh, here are the key points for HTTP. What is that? How, uh, how does HTTP works? And what is the status code? Uh, I don't want to explain what is HTTP because I think you have already known it and how it works. You should know what is uh, HTML, URI, URL, something like that. Just go through these slides. So we just directly come to this status code. Go to page 150. Yeah. For the HTTP, Yeah, 
for the status code. Uh, let's have a look of the request here. So we know we have a request and response in HTTP message, right? When we send a request, uh, we are expecting to receive a response. So the request will in this format, you can see uh, the first one is the method and this one is the uh, URI. So the thing we want and this part will be the version, HTTP 1.1 version. And in here we use the, uh, I don't know how to describe it, just the format. And here are the headers, including some metadata we want. So indicate what kind of response are we want and what kind of connection I we want to create it and what kind of browser are we using here, the use agent, right? And then we come to the response message here because we send a request. So we are expecting to receive a response from the host. So the first line will be the status line. The first thing on the first line will be the HTTP version to specify it is a HTTP message with the version 1.1 and the 200 OK will be the status code and phrase and that's what I want to talk about uh, let's have a look of it later but let's just go through all the contents here the header header will be some metadata of the, the response including the uh, server name the last modify and e tag which specify the content like the identity of the content and the uh, set range like other stuff not really important and bef after the headers will be the content of the data. So that's, that's the response. So just have a look of the response data code, like 200, most common one, we call it 200 okay, which means the request is succeed. You like need to memorize it. And um, yeah, I think it will be tested either midterm exam or final exam for the status code. So just be aware of it because we are open book exam. You don't need to memorize all the status code. So, but you need to know what is status code. So in here, we can see for the status code start from two, will be always related to successful. And when it start from three here, it will be related to the redirection. For example, 302 will, will ask you to go to another web like location. And when we start from four, it will always related to the cost like client side error they can see this one bad request which means we send a request that have like invalid format and 404 also start from four which means you uh, the resources we are requested is not exist right in previous lab we have write something about that so for the code start from four will be always an error in the client side in the request side and the code start from phi, this one, like 505 HTTP version not supported, or 502 uh, internal server internal error, something like that, will be the thing related to the server side. So we are sending a good request, but the server side have some trouble with it. So it will return the status code start from phi. So just be aware of the uh, this category, so, so it will be fine. Mm, what is 418? Actually, I didn't see 418 in real life. I don't know. 
you can write a, a server that can re return for 418. So that's all for the status code and come to the method. So what is the method? So for the status code, we can always have a look of the status code in find the status code on the in the response, right? But for the method, where, where can we find it? Where can we find the method? Is it in the request or response? And back to the response here, request here. You can see this one, we call it method. It's in the first line in our request, right? So it must be a very important thing, this one. So let's just have a look. What is the method request type, right? Request method type. In HTTP 1.0, we have only three methods. The 1.1, which is we are using right now, we have lots of methods, but make sure you can understand this method. So you need to understand what are they. So if I send a post request, what does it mean? For example, if I send a guest, request, what does it mean? Let's say we send a guest, get request to Google. So it will always asking about some resources, like I want to browse the homepage of Google. So I will send a get request. So what if I want to uh, log in to my Google account? So I will send a post request, right? Yes, I want to send something to the server uh, what if i want to register a new account on google so it will be also post something right so the get and post is different and the put delays you can like have a look at it by yourself try uh, make sure you can understand it so in some question, you will always ask you, uh, I will show you uh, HTTP information, including the request and response. And we'll ask you what kind of, uh, what kind of request method are they using? It should be pretty easy. Just know what is request method part type and, and you can understand the response message, then you will be fine. So make sure you can understand the first line, especially for the response and request. Understand every content in here, okay? And we come to the version of HTTP here. So what is the difference between HTTP 1.0 and 1.1? You can see that 1.0 is non-persistent. So what does non-persistent mean? And what is pipelining and caching? So for the point one to four will be concept stuff. It's very easy if you can understand what is HTTP. For, but for this part will be the calculation part for HTTP. So we may have a look of them carefully because it, it will have some calculation stuff related to it. Uh, just have a look of the HTTP 1.0. Let me find it. Yep. So, if we want to send a HTTP request to the server, we want to, uh, if you still remember the layering stuff, we need to put it inside a TCP packet, right? And put it inside an IP packet. So in here, we only consider the TCP stuff. So it would require to build a T 
TCP connection before we send the information, right? Let's have a look of the picture here. Here. In 1.1 here, but will be the same process. In here, we will require to initiate a TCP connection before we send a request. So we will reach the server at first to create a TCP connection and the server will get back to us, which means we are like create the, like the TCP connection successfully. And then we can stand, send a request here in the second line. So, so does it make sense? So, so in no matter what kind of HTTP version are we using, we are always, required to create a TCP connection before we send the request. But what is the difference between HTTP 1.0 and 1.1? It will be like the times we need to create the TCP connection because we already know that HTTP 1.0 is non-persistent connection, right? So every time we send a request, we are required to build a TCP connection here. So which a kind of waste of time, right? But in this picture is 1.1. So we can, we can like create a TCP connection and we keep it alive. So we can use it for lots of transformation. We can request a lot of times, right? And in this picture, is, uh, we are showing about the pipelining here. Here, you can see there are three requests is sent at the same time. And we can receive three response at the same time, so which save us a lot of time. If we request it one by one, it's obviously will waste a lot of time like this, right? So we call it pipelining. So now you understand what is pipelining. It is just send different requests at the same time. And yeah, that's all for what we need. And the caching. Caching is related to the CDN. And how does it work? So basically caching is to speed up and save the data usage. You can have a read of it by yourself. How does web cache works? What is proxy? I'm not going to explain it because it's not pretty important. And here we just focus on this three part and let's go to the practice here. Uh, yeah, I already answered this question. Yeah. Go to the next one, the calculation part. So now we want to fetch a HTML page with a base file, and it will have different objects inside of uh, HTML page. Let's say you have some pictures on it. So we need to request the HTML page at first. And then we find, uh, we still need to fetch the pictures and then send another request to get the pictures. So how long does it take to download the all page, all the stuff in the page with the non-persistent HTTP, which is 1.0, right? So how does it work? Let's draw pictures here. We know if it's non-persistent HTTP, we will request to send a TCP request at first, and the server will get back to us to create a TCP here. And then we can send a request after the TCP connected, right? So that's 1.0 work. But what if we want to send the second request 
can we send a request here? Nope, we can't send a request here because we need to start from build a TCP connection. So for non-persistent HTTP, we are always required to build a TCP connection before we send a request. And after each request and response is received, our connection will be like closed. So we call it 1.0. And so in this scenario, how can we calculate the time? It's pretty easy, right? Because every time we want to send a request, it will be two RTT here, one RTT here, one RTT here, plus the file transfer time, because we need to download the file here. So the in the first stage, we need to download the HTML page. It will be two RTT, which is two D, because one RTT equal to D, right, in here. Plus the size of file, which is S0, and divide by the speed of our internet, which is C. And in the second stage, we have our HTML, and we find, oh, it has some pictures to download. So we need to fetch the pictures one by one, which means it will have, uh, for one of the picture, it will take two RTT as the same, like this, we, need, we will need to create a TCP link and then send the request of the picture plus the size of the picture, which is M, divided by the speed, because we have M, pictures here, we have lots of pictures. So we need to multiply it by N. So for the stage one and stage two, just uh, add them together. So what would be the answer? Probably this one. Does it make sense? So make sure you can understand this question and how this two stage works. Yeah, let me know if you have any question here because this part is very, very important. So I will stay uh, here for like one or two minutes. If you have any doubt, just type it or speak. seems all good because this part is always the exam so yeah make sure you understand all the stuff and come to here same scenario but we use persistent http so it's asking about the difference between non-persistent and persistent http so what is persistent http do you still remember the uh, keep a live header in our request. That thing is indicates we want to build a persistent HTTP. So we will keep the TCP connection after the first request. So in here will be the same. We will send the TCP request and build a TCP link here will be the same, but what if we want to send the request, like we want to send lots of requests. If, for example, we have already sent a request. Now we want to send another request 
is it okay? Obviously it's okay, right? Because we call it persistent connection. So we can send as much request as we want to, to, until we end the connection, until we send a message to say, hey, I want to close the TCP connection here and we, we will close it. So in here it's obviously will be faster than the non-persistent HTTP. So what will be the uh, delay, like the time for the stage one? In the stage one, we need to create a TCP connection, right? So it will be 2, 2D to create a TCP and send a request for the HTML. So it's 2D to RTT plus the size of size of the file as zero divide by divide by C the speed. But in the second stage, we are downloading the objects, let's say pictures on, on the web page. So do we still need to create a TCP connection? No, we don't because we have already created. So every time we request a picture, we just send a simple request and wait for the response. So it will be one RTT, which is D plus the size of picture, is it S divided by C? And we have N pictures of it, so multiply by N. And finally, we just add them together and will be the answer. Does it make sense? So all we need to know here is the difference between non-persistent and persistent HTTP connection. Okay, go to the next one, the same scenario, but we are using persistent HTTP with pipelining. So what does pipelining mean? If you still remember, we'll be, we are required, uh, we are be able to send a lot of requests at the same time, right? So the phase one will be the same. We'll be send the TCP connection and get back to build the TCP. And then we can request for the web page, right? So, so it, we call it HTML. We are requesting for the HTML. And then we will send a lot of requests to get the pictures of it. Like this, pictures. Do you, do you know why we like don't request at the first time, we need to separate the HTML and pictures. You have any idea why we, why we don't send the request altogether instead of separate it to first stage and second stage. So why we request the HTML at first, then request the pictures later than the HTML? Why shouldn't we just request HTML and pictures all together? Yeah, the reason is because at first we are requesting this HTML, but we don't know where is the, uh, we don't know there are some pictures on here, right? So that's the reason we, uh, request the HTML at first and then request the pictures because we don't know they have lots of pictures on the HTML. So it will still have two phase, but you can see here, we only consume 
three RTT here, three RTT. And plus the time we spend on the file transfer. This one could be the right answer. Make sense? This part is really important. So in the midterm exam will be something calculation related to this kind of stuff. And for the final exam, it will mix with the TCP stuff. So it will still be the calculation for the time it, it will need, but it will also like connect it with the other part up later than the week five. So to understand this kind of quantum is crucial. Let's come to the DNS part. Mm, I think I have already explained what is DNS, just domain name server. We can use it to uh, get the IP address or other stuff from the server. So what we need to do, just send the URL to the domain name server and we can get the IP address of it. And then we can have a look of the contents here, page 215. In here, uh, the thing I want to mention here, so what kind of connection are we used to uh, communicate with, to, with the DNS? Is it TCP or UDP? Didn't see anything here. Yeah, doesn't mention, but you should know that. So are we using TCP or UDP with the DNS? Yeah, we are using the UDP connection with the DNS because the UDP connection is faster. Okay. So you need to learn about the uh, type of DNS records and the DNS name. Um, not sure what should I go through all of them because lots of content. I, I prefer you to have a look of the lecture if you don't understand any content of it. So, but I don't think it's pretty important because you have already learned lots of DNS stuff uh, during the lab, right? Use the dig command. And for the caging, caging, uh, pretty easy to understand. I don't want to explain it. And the protocol, we don't need to like understand too much about it to the, for the DNS. We don't need to know or memorize the structure of it. It's okay that you just have a look of it. And yeah, if you can't remember it, it that will be totally fine. So, because I don't think DNS is a very important part for our midterm exam. Just go through all the uh, training stuff here. Let's just talk about some interesting topics here. The DDoS attack or the other stuff, DNS poisoning, caging, cage poisoning. So when we use a dig command, it will re return the response something like this, right? So if someone can do the cage poisoning, which means when we do the query, like when we do a query related to the drevo.com, we are requesting this one's IP address, right? It will also give some information of google.com, which is weird, but it did. 
So the server will catch it, or our computer will catch it. So it will save a ROM IP address into for the google.com. So when we visit google.com and we thought we went to the google.com, but we are not, we are connected to an unknown host, which is unsafe. So we may send our searching stuff or send our password username to this IP address. They can pretend they are Google and they will provide us an exactly the same page with as Google. Then we will send the uh, like account details or our private information to the website. So we call it cage poisoning. And there are another kind of cage like DNS poisoning uh, is we can do the pollution of the DNS. So like some government or some company can control this, like they are able to change the IP address of the website as their desire. So for example, uh, the Chinese government are able to change the IP address for google.com, facebook.com, twitter.com, something like that. So the Chinese citizens are not able to assess this kind of web page in mainland China because the government allows some company to do this to avoid the citizen to assess the outside uh, of China. So there are lots of like attack methods related to the DNS, which is quite interesting. And just go through the quiz here and you can uh, understand what is DNS. But in here, I just uh, have a look of some important thing. This one. So if you want to send an email to our letter, yeah, this one is right. Why? Because the type MX means mail, right? And the C name means canonical name, the real name. And the NS means ser name server, authoritative name server. And type A means the IP address. So when we're requesting about the mail stuff, email stuff, and it is related to the DNS, it will always be MX stuff. And this one, when you open the browser and try to visit something, the minimum number of DNS requests sent by your local DNS server to obtain the IP address is. So this is your computer. When you want to get the IP address of sitting.com, how can you get the IP address of it? Let's say when you reach the local DNS server, this one is the our local DNS server. How many hops? It's zero. Why zero hops? Because your local DNS server may have the IP records for zitting.com, right? It doesn't need to go to the other side to do the query. It may have the, the content already. So the hop is zero. Yeah, you're right. The caching stuff. So our local DNS server may save some records in here in the, in the server itself because we may have lots of computer connected to it, right? And some of them are requesting the same thing. And the server will have a table of it to do the records. So when you requesting the same thing and they will send the stuff directly to you. And of course they have a time to live, right? We call it TTL. 
I'm not sure if you have learned it all or or not. Uh, you should be aware not every content will be like stay in the server for a very long time. They have a, a thing which called time to live, let's say uh, probably 30, which means the content in here, the content in here, it only will be exist in the server for 30 seconds. Once it get expired, even you send the same request and the content is still valid, it will go back to the server and request it again to make sure the content is up to date. But yeah, for, if you don't know what is time to lie, just forgot it doesn't really matter here. And the P2P. Mm, for the P2P stuff, I just want to explain what is uh, tick for tech. Uh, page two, four, nine. So the P2P architecture is, it doesn't need a server to support us to do the communication. So P2P means peer to peer. So all the clients will be connected together with each other and then share their information. Unlike the centralized network, we are all connected. For example, the Zoom, it's not P2P architect architecture. We are connected to the Zoom server. And yeah, for example, my computer is uploading the image, the recording, the sounds into the Zoom server and you download it from the Zoom server. But for the P2P file structure, we are connected with each other. Uh, let's go to the T4TAT. So T4TAT is the, uh, let's say the logic, how P2P works. Because we know P2P is connected with each other and shares the stuff, right? But how, how can we share the stuff? So that's the way, just go through this paragraph. It's very important to understand this. Uh, it says we, it will share with the top four every 10 seconds. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes, it's 10 seconds, right? So we will share our chunks, our file with the top four, top four peer that are currently sending the chunks to at highest rate. Does it make sense? So who share the file with us, we will do the same. But another rule is, and very important one, every 30 seconds, we will randomly select another peer and share it. So which means there is a lucky boy, he don't need to do anything and he will receive my file. This one, will be tested on the exam probably if we are asking the thing about p2p it will be a frequent ask question and the dht distribute hash table hash table here Yeah, just go through, but I don't know how to explain it. It's pretty easy to understand. Yeah. This circular, yeah, just understand this circular DHT. So what if the one of the user is quit? And what if one is joined into the circuit? and how to do the query, like uh, who is the responsible for key 14. 
just try to understand what is DHT here. And what if the like appear disconnected? Mm, yeah, I think to for the DHT, just go through these slides, the pH room will be good. And come, let's just go through some example here. The big torrent, T4 TAT. Right, because we said the T4 TAT is for the, uh, how it works, how we run the P P2T algorithm. So the T4 TAT is choosing the person we, to receive our data. Does it make sense? Yeah, and Todd join the is trying to download something, but he does not want to upload any data. But he, is it possible that he can receive the whole file? We say yes. If even he does not upload anything, according to the T4, tag rules, we will choose a random people to receive our chunks, right? So if you stay online for a very long time, you will be able to receive all the content that we need. And next part, CDN. CDN, uh, so just have a look of it, but not very important. It may be tested, maybe not. All you need to do is understand what is CDN and yeah, how can we use it? So you may find lots of CDN when you like browsing the foreign like website, not in this country or the video website, you will find some CDN. So basically it's to speed up that we reach the content. Okay. So after the CDN, we come to the transport layer, which is the last part where we test it. The reliable data transfer is for the TCP, right? We need to understand all the concepts for the RDT, uh, including the version of it for the TCP version. RDT. Uh, just sim go through it very quick. Search the RDT and let's see what is the version difference for the RDT 1.0. So basically 1.0 does nothing. And for the RDT 2.0, we have introduced two important stuff, which the first one is ACK, and the second one is NAX. So we use ACK to acknowledge we receive a message or receive the data from the sender. And we use NAC to indicate we receive a invalid data. It's, it is invalid data, okay? It's not, uh, it does, doesn't mean the data is missing or lost on the middle. It's just invalid, probably missed something or uh, corrupted. 
So for this kind of mechanism, it will have a bug. So what if the neck is missing? So our sender will never know what is the state for the previous data we sent. So we have RDT 2.1. We add a sequence number here. What is the sequence number and why should we use the sequence number? Because we can use the sequence number to indicate the duplicate file, right? We don't need to open the file and have a look of it because sometimes we can't understand it. So we can't compare it. But with the sequence number, it will be it very, very easy to compare different packets if they are the same or not, like this. So we send the data we, and we, the sequence number is zero. And next one, we can send data one here. So when we send the same data and the receiver will realize it and drop it. So that's RDT 2.1. And in 2.2, .2, we just delete the neck because we can use the egg to represent neck. And here we can use egg to do the acknowledgement, but we can also use the egg to replace the neck. You can see the difference here. When the sender is trying to send data one, right? But the file is corrupted we can acknowledge act zero, which means we didn't receive data one here. And the sender will know that and send the data one again. So that's how it work, how we use act to imply a NAC. And in RDT 3.0, it will uh, solve the problem we have before. So last time we say, uh, what if our NAC or NAC is missing. So in RTT 3.0, we put a lock, like we put a clock here. It will have a timeout for every package we send. So if we didn't receive any response, and finally we will become timeout and we will send it again. So that's RTT 3.0. So sometimes we will ask some question related to the, this kind of version. So if we are using RTT 2.0, what will happen if we uh, miss the packet on something like that? So should be aware of the difference between different version of RTT. And the next part will be the go back and, and selective repeats will be also the uh, theory contents. So you just go through it by yourself and try to do some example or draw the pictures in here. Just draw the pictures by yourself. If you I feel um, I'm not familiar with the RDT 3.0 and 2.0, what is the difference? So the best idea to understand it to, is to just draw the pictures by yourself. Just like, yeah, do the same thing. You can draw it and then you will know it. Yeah. And for the TCP, what is sing? What is sing that sing that? And act plus data exchange. Just know the concepts. But I would say for the TCP part, uh, most of the content the on, in the exam will be related to the uh, number of sequence, like sequence number. Let me find an example here. Uh, something like this, I, I say, it will probably will delete one or two line here and ask you to fill it. Like I will delete the response here and ask you to, uh, what will be the sequence number, what will be the arc con uh, acknowledge content here, uh, what will be the sequence number here. Yes, so I, I, I'm pretty sure in the exam we'll have some 
something like this. It will give you a lot of scenario and ask, ask you if you can fill the blank, like what will be the sequence number for, for this response? What will be the act number for this response? Like that, etc. So we will have lots of practice content uh, on our GitHub. Just try to do some of them. First thing you should do the tutorial after the review. Just go through the tutorial one, go through it. And because we have already have the answer, so I, I will not explain the answer here, but if you have any question, you just let me know. And you can also post it on the forum for the discussion. And here we also have more samples. So if you, you are not comfortable with the transport layer, just have a look of it. This one. And this is the IP layer. Network. Nope. Oh, yeah, this part, sorry. Let me go back and something like that. Just go through the practice. And yeah, of course, your homework. Just have a look of, have a look of your homework again. And I think you will get a high mark on the meter exam. Don't worry too much. Just make sure you understand all the concepts here. And I have already pointed out some, some like important point, important knowledge point in the meter exam. So just let me know. Uh, the fast transmission, not sure it will be tested, but I think so. So how the fast retransmission work? Yeah, and I think that's all the content we have for today. So if you have any question, just let me know. We still have 10 minutes. Because today is too much, too less time for too much content. I was trying to cover all the points we have learned. But for the transport layer, because you have already learned it, so I didn't spend a lot of time on it. Because I think you have like you have fresh memory about it. But the key point is uh, trying to understand the different version and understand go back and, and selective repeat. What is that? And then come to the uh, TCP stuff, how, uh, how we use SIM and CNAC, and what will be the uh, sequence number or how large is the packet? Uh, what is the sequence number when we send the SIM and the ARC stuff? something like that. So we will always test the sequence number in this part. Like this, we will uh, delete one of the uh, digits, then ask you to fill it, fill it. Do the calculation, should be pretty easy one. Just go through it by yourself.
Uh, is there any coding question or needed to use command like dig or ns lookup? I don't think so. Uh, the all the stuff related to the coding will be examined in the uh, your assignment. I don't think they will have lots of like programming stuff or ask you to run the dig command during the exam. Yeah. Just ask me any question related to the uh, tutorial or midterm exam. Uh, for calculation questions, we will we need to upload working hours or something similar. Uh, I'm not, I'm not really sure if all the question will be the multiple choice question or do they have the blank for you to, for you to fill the answer or not? Not pretty sure. But yeah, if you are doing the calculation and they leave a blank to you to fill it, you must show all the uh, pr like steps. Even your answer is wrong, you will still get the marks part of the marks if you like show your understanding. Yeah, and I think next week we may have more information uh, related to our midterm exam, but make sure you can, uh, you, you start for the preparation from now. In this week, probably you can go through all the uh, slides that we have, and next week you can do some practice before the ex exam. So, and yeah, I think you will get a very good marks on the midterm. Yes, there's no lab for this week. Uh, I'm checking if we need to do any submission for this week. Uh, I don't think we have any submissions for this week. Yeah. Great. So yeah, if you have time, just getting started for the midterm exam or do part of the assignment.
uh, reading a task textbook? Uh, nope. I think all we need to do is just have a look of the slides. That will be enough and do more practice with the homework and quiz. Yeah, just, just have a look of the lecture stuff, material, go through it. I'm about to turn off the meeting for now. So thanks for coming for this week and I will see you next week. Okay, bye.